Are you sick and tired of lame-ass social media? Are you sick and tired of turning on the TV and being bored to tears? Well, never fear. Roundtable Philosophy is here to save the day, bringing you new and interesting podcasts each and every week. Let's get the party started. talk about sex bacon cheesy bread guns riots friends we're gonna do it proper this time i haven't really followed it too much this week but i have noticed that things in baltimore are getting pretty hairy seems that a guy died in police custody not exactly sure how that happens but i believe that was the reason the riot started I guess if somebody's a little more reading than myself, go ahead and jump in. I think a week ago or so or something like that, um, there was a gentleman who was taken into custody and he had some type of spinal injury and he was asking them to, to get the ambulance, but they never did. So while he was in their custody, he died. People have been like, you know, in an uprise or whatever, angry because another black man gets killed by the police and nothing's going to be done. I have mixed feelings about, but they should have called the police or something. Not the police, they should have called the ambulance. Somebody has like a broken back or something, I'm pretty sure you would hear the pop when you're trying to put the cuffs on them or something. But now everybody's mad, throwing rocks, burning things down, and they had to call in the National Guard, and they're probably going to start shooting people soon. Where I work, we got an outage notification because there's some main offices around the heart of where the riot and fires are. And I found it interesting because they gave a map of all the locations just to kind of show where our company assets were amidst all of it. And about, I want to say 50 to 60 locations that were either fire or looting, there are only two places that were noted as peaceful protests. And I'm looking at an article now that talks about how some people are seeing nonviolence as compliance. Personally, I don't know when that distinction formed, and I wonder if y'all have any commentary on that. Well, let's go ahead and figure some history. Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, two of the most well-known speakers for equal rights or for really for rights for their people, at least, who were being a pressed by another group within the same country or possibly different government, and did so by using a non-violent protest. They knew that violence and hate would only beget more hate, and it would only encourage more violence to occur. So they went with a mature approach and demonstrated either through their acts of turning the other cheek, standing up even with a broken body, and other things of that nature. Or sit-ins. I mean, these were people who actually had true diction and true conviction with their words and their actions. And they lived by the principles of that when they protested for the rights of those people. And when I see what's going on currently, and I hear those names being thrown across saying, oh, we need to protest like they did back in the day. We need to do it like MLK or such. I'm kind of like, you are a freaking idiot who knows nothing at all about that time period. He never lived during it in the first place. And second of all, wrong in all counts. That's not even what they even did. You, on the other hand, break into a CVS, set the thing place on fire after you loot it from other things as well. And then you still going to go out and keep on rioting, wearing masks over your face, hoodies, sweatpants, trying to cover your form, your identity, and yet you're going to keep saying that you're being oppressed and such and that we are the bad people or that the police are doing the wrong thing. Now, I will be willing to admit the police screwed up majorly. If you have someone who has a spinal cord injury, whether it's being severed or even possible fracture and such, unless they were literally just arrested for massacring a school or something, you probably need to call an ambulance just because one of the times we live in, which would cause a lot of press, and a lot of controversy, and two, because it's a serious injury. You don't have spinal injuries and just walk it off like, oh, no big deal. It's just like having a sunburn. Huh. That's blatant ignorance. And there's one thing worse than hatred. It's ignorance within hatred. That's just passed on. It's a big injury that's passed on through generations. And it's all based off hearsay and half-truths to cover somebody else's ass and things that have happened before in the past that nobody even knows about now because it's just been hidden. I mean, I definitely agree with you on that front. And I think it kind of goes into when you, you know, you brought up today's world. Media is also a big issue. I was a media studies major in college. And if you polled people, 
they are more likely to be shot on the street by someone they don't know, a mugging gone wrong, than be hurt by anyone they know. And it's the exact opposite. I've been listening back on, you know, the past podcasts and, you know, kind of touching on what y'all discussed last week. You know, you can just flip out a smartphone and if you egg someone on enough, you know, the opposite color of you because you want something to happen, you can egg them on enough till they get mad and then turn your phone on, record it. And there's no pre that moment context or post that moment context. You don't know really what happened on either end. Granted, there have been a lot of situations where it's been beneficial that people have recorded with, you know, some shootings that have happened recently. I can't remember what city it was in that an officer point blank shot a man running away from him. I think that was very very good that someone was recording it. But I think with every coin, there are two sides. And now that people know the power in using recording moments, they can cause them. I think y'all are mostly all men. As grown men, do you feel like your views, having discussions like this have changed? Do you feel like you're impacted in a positive way that makes you see both sides now? Or do you think it's actually causing such harm that your automatic reaction is to assume what you've seen is accurate? What, what's the old phrase? Uh, believe nothing you see and only half of what you hear? Exactly. So I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that the media will more than likely spin what gets the most ratings and what feeds the hate machine. It's not necessarily fact. It's just what looks good and what they can get a story out of. Now, sometimes I guess they align, but I feel like a lot of the time whenever you watch TV, that's honestly why I kind of stop just watching the news and I kind of rely on social media to tell me what's up. And even some of that stuff, you really got to filter through because a lot of the same stories are just getting recycled by other sites. And if one source is not really very good, then X number of other sites that are generating the same story are going to be equally as misinformed and misrepresenting with their information. But you know, I've never really been around anything like that. And I don't know, you know, if I'd be whipping out my camera phone, I, I hope I would. It'd be nice to kind of catch what's going on. But I mean, you can't catch everything. And to kind of bring up the point about the peaceful protest, I don't really know at what point if it actually started out being a peaceful protest and then it turned violent. And you can also look at the Ferguson type situation as well. You know, what was the tipping point? What made it actually go from being a peaceful protest to essentially burning the city to the ground and looting and rioting, injuring police officers? I mean, I think right now uh, they're under a curfew up in Baltimore and the National Guard has been deployed or will be, according to something I read earlier, to kind of keep things in order. It's really sad that the military has to get involved because people are just out of control. But the police aren't equipped to deal with, I don't think, the, the group of people in a way that the military would be. I don't know what their thought is on that. Maybe Matt can shed some light since he's in the military. Uh, so none of my military experience really has anything to do with personal control. It's all uh, shipboard systems and engineering related. So I really have no idea. I'm assuming whoever they're pulling in has some sort of training because you're not going to take people like me or people that sit behind a desk all day and have no training uh, in that situation and call them up when there are other people available. So uh, my guess is the people they've called have at least some training, probably not the best training because uh, you can't just have 10,000 perfectly trained riot cops with full body cameras that know how to de-escalate every single situation available at your beck and call. So then what would the difference be in police that are trained to handle riots versus a soldier? What makes them different? So you're looking at two fundamentally different operating theories, right? Police are told to generally, the concept is police uh, are told to only use lethal force under certain situations. And that most of the time, especially when dealing with some sort of violent confrontation or domestic dispute, they're mediators, they're de-escalators, and then they call in for backup when required. Military personnel are not trained to de-escalate a situation unless they're military police. They're trained to put bullets down range and to stop aggressive targets only. Even the weapons they're issued when they are trained are weapons for killing. Police, when riot gear, are issued riot shields, they're issued shotguns with beanbags, they're issued mace, they're issued pepper spray, that's generally not what most infantry are trained on. There are schools where they can be trained on those weapons, but you're looking to subdue a population of citizens. You're not looking to crush an army. 
there is a difference in the training and in the weaponry. And even if they're all given riot shields and they're all given beanbag shotguns, this is not something that they've had very much experience with. So then by deploying troops from the National Guard, would that mean that they're allowed to just use whatever means necessary? So the rules of engagement still have to be followed. And in fact, I'm pretty sure the rules of engagement would have to be even more stringent because you're not fighting enemy combatants or even the possibility of enemy combatants. You're dealing with de-escalating a civilian situation. So the rules of engagement are an issue which I'm, I'm not familiar with. However, when the last time the National Guard was issued in certain locations, in Ohio, for example, in the 60s, you had peaceful protests turned violent. And then the National Guard shot some people and there were four students who wound up dying because of it. I believe there's a James Taylor song about it uh, or a Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young song about it because those are soldiers. They're not police trained in de-escalation. So yes, having more bodies uh, available to combat the situation will have an effect. But in a perfect world, you would just bus in riot cops from every other city in the world to supply the number of people you need. But you can't do that. Most police forces are undermanned as it is, and very few people want to drive 12, 13, 14 hours to go help out in in Baltimore where they know it's a violent situation. uh, Some of the National Guard are actually trained in riot control. Uh, So it's not like they're just out there with, you know, M4s or M16s or something getting ready to shoot everybody. Oh, absolutely. Some of them will be trained. I don't know if all of them will be trained. I deal with shipboard systems and engineering systems. I don't have any sort of riot control. I've never had a class on that. And uh, even if it was offered, I don't think I'd really ask to attend it. It's just nothing I've had to deal with nor expect to deal with. So yes, they may one week a year uh, be trained in riot control. Uh, But I don't think that's really their purpose. Their purpose is soldiering and rescue efforts because a lot of times the National Guard is called upon during a national disaster uh, where they'll come in after a hurricane or they'll come in during a power outage or food shortage and then they'll provide assistance. If necessary, during a time of war, they'll provide military training. They'll also provide military support for full-time soldiers Uh, And then in other times, they're actually rolled in and they're included with the standard infantry and doing what a full-time soldier would do. If I was in charge of developing the training program for the National Guard, I don't think I would put riot control on the top of my list of training because, God forbid, they're needed to be called up to Iraq or Afghanistan. I don't know how effective riot control is going to be at keeping them alive. There was uh, actually a similar situation that happened in Louisiana What had actually happened was there was this guy, he was having an argument with his girlfriend, and by the time the police got there, the argument was over. They actually arrested him for having sagging pants, and while they were arresting him, his girlfriend was apparently warning them not to be rough with him because she said he had some problems, I think some mental issues and some kind of heart condition, and they said, don't tase him. And then there was a video released where there was like five or six of them on top of him. And one of the officers was tasing him continuously for like a minute or so. And they left him there and he was lying there motionless for like eight minutes. At some point, someone came and like peeked in the window. But eventually what happened was uh, one of the cops opened the door and went in to check on him because he hadn't moved. But instead of checking on him like you would if you were concerned about the person, he just kind of like kicked his leg like, come on, get up or something like that. And he was dead. He had died in police custody basically while being dogpiled. That's the kind of thing that is understandably pissing people off. But I wouldn't say that I condone any kind of violence or, you know, rioting because really smashing up stores and burning cars and throwing rocks at police, that's not doing anything to help you. I know it's frustrating and you could be genuinely angry, and some of them aren't even doing it because they're genuinely angry. Some of them are just doing it because they want to be violent assholes. But I don't see how any of that helps your issue. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little confused by the story uh, simply because if, a, if an individual is being arrested and another person who is cognizant of this individual, knows this individual, knows their medical condition, comes up to to a police officer and says, oh, by the way, I don't think you should tase this guy should something happen. You're limiting the police officer's capabilities to do whatever. If the person who tells them is not a doctor and just says, hey, he has 
uh, this condition, who a police officer is not expected to be familiar with medical conditions. Um, uh, yes, probably not the best call. However, if a person is doing something they shouldn't do, a taser is a much better option to subdue them than running the risk of tackling themselves, getting in a significant injury where this individual can bite you. Maybe they have something on them or even taking a gun out and shooting them. A taser is the preferred option. So if someone who is involved in a domestic dispute tells me, and I'm a police officer, oh, by the way, I would not recommend you tase this guy, I'm going to say, gotcha. However, if this guy is going to do something wrong, and I don't, I'm not familiar with this case, I haven't seen the video, tasing is still an option. It's much better than getting shot at. And I think 99% of the time, someone who says, don't tase me, bro, and then they tase him, is going to be better off than if he says, don't tase me, bro, and the police goes, well, I have no other option, so I'm going to put a 9 millimeter round through his chest. Again, yeah, but... I'm yeah, not but, familiar with the situation. But they already had him in the cell, and there were like five or six of them already on top of him. And then they brought in the taser. So is this is this a standard police practice, though? That's something we have to look at because a lot of uh, states and a lot of the police uh, – not I'm sorry, not the police, but the prison systems – will publish what is an acceptable means of dealing with someone – inside of a cell, outside of a cell, transiting to a cell. So if it is an acceptable process that four or five guys hold this guy down, he's still being violent, they need to get the cops off of him and out of the cell so they can lock him up, is it acceptable to tase him? If that's part of the standing operating procedure, then that is absolutely acceptable. That's why it's a standard operating procedure. Now, if, if that procedure is wrong and we find out later that, hey, that procedure is, is not acceptable, then by all means change the procedure. But if they were following all the procedures which are set forth by the prison systems, approved by doctors and approved by the state saying, we decide that this is the adequate means to handle a person who is in a cell, who is violent, resisting arrest, whatever the situation is, uh, or is just not dealing with the, with the prison guards in the correct manner, if that's acceptable, then it's fine. And if someone, random individual involved in the case says, oh, I, I don't recommend you tase him, that's not a really good credible sis source of evidence. I, I would take that under advisement because in this situation, if it turns out negative and the person is significantly injured or dead, then yes, it would probably come up in a court hearing and it would be difficult to explain. But again, you're, you're handicapping a cop who's already, the moment he shows up to a domestic dispute case, even if it's already settled by then, is in danger. The most dangerous thing a cop can do is respond to a domestic dispute because even if he selects the, the person who's aggressive and arrests them, there's a good chance that the, the other person involved will become violent against the police themselves. Police don't like domestic dispute cases. They never end well. They're always on their guard. You really have to be careful, which is why I'm glad I don't have to deal with that. Give me machines any day. But I think that's what the problem is, like, the, the rioting is because, like, police, they're too – I think some police are too quick to jump and, like, you know, like, try to defend themselves in a certain way, which that's why I think that so many people are rioting the way they are because, like, the police were probably, like, I'm not quite sure what the guy did. I don't know how he got his spine broken, but, like, I'm sure that, like, he was, quote, unquote, resisting arrest and, like – 10 officers pop out of nowhere and jump on a 150 pound guy like they do in almost every situation. And they probably broke something. And he was like, and he was screaming. He's like, Hey, I need an ambulance. I need an ambulance. I need an ambulance. And they're probably standing there, probably standing there saying like, Oh, shut up. You don't know. Uh, we're not going to listen to you. And I think there are too many cops that are out there that are too quick to like, you know, like, let me like, you know, try to subdue the situation. Let me try to do something. And they're not really like listening to the person they're not really treating the 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 person who they're arresting as a person like on the on the news the other day when I was up when I was still in New York um there were these three Swedish cops who broke up a fight in the the subway and like you see these three Swedish cops they're like like two of them are sitting on one guy they're sitting on and the other guys on the other one but instead of like you no know, like yelling at them and like punching them in the face they're like they had them like subdued on the ground but they're asking them like are you okay is anything hurt about you all this stuff until the police come came so um i just think a lot of cops they're not really trained proper well they're trained but they're not like like you said like a lot of these departments are like they're underfunded and understaffed so like these cops are already tired they're angry they're just like thinking of like 
old situations that they went through. So, like, they're like, oh, no, like, this person could be doing anything. They're acting crazy. So, like, let me just, like, use all of my force that I can with them when I don't always think that they should because, like, me personally, I've been in situations where, like, I haven't been doing anything. Then all of a sudden, like, six cops pull up and ask me, like, oh, who are you? What are you doing? Where are you going? And they're, like, hassling me for no apparent reason. And I can just imagine me being a big black guy and me just start, like, you know, acting crazy. Like, they're going to start jumping on me and, like, smacking me in the face with their billy clubs. So I just think uh, some, like, I'm not saying rioting is right. I think it's very stupid because, like, if the cops started, like, you know, like, spraying bullets through the air, like, I wouldn't be surprised. But, like, I think a lot of people are angry because a lot of this stuff happens all the time even though it's been happening for years upon years, so I don't know why people are suddenly so surprised that it's still happening. But um, I don't know. I think people should just stay in their house. Stop, stop acting stupid. That's why. That's why so many like black guys between certain ages get a bad rap. They just think all of us are like thugs and hooligans and just run around and like smoke. But funny thing about that is, um, some of the news. Come news broadcasters, they're going around and talking to people. There's actually gang members in Baltimore that were kind of trying to come together and stop the violence, which I thought was kind of awkward. You have all these these gang members that are like walking around saying like, "Oh, we want to stop the violence." When like you know, it's kind of ironic that like on any other day they could be on the corner like selling drugs and like shooting each other. So anyway, there's my two cents. <laughs> And going off what you just said, I'm actually I'm looking at like images and stuff of what's going on, and I think um, that situation where you know people who would normally you know gangs don't don't necessarily want violence, but I think a lot of gangs throughout history have been created to you know protect, and I think one thing you know protect in the way that they see they only can their community. It's you know it's kind of like a a fraternity style you know you do what you can for each other and. I think that that image of gang, you know, gang, like historically violent gangs coming out to be like, no, this is not, you're not doing this for a reason. You're just doing it because you're angry is impactful. And I'm also, I found this image of a bunch of Baltimore citizens who are actually lining up um, to protect a line of police uh, kind of in a, in a way to be like, you know, you don't, you don't need to do this. And they're, you know, they, they look like they're from all walks of life. We've got men in suits. We've got men who look, you know, like they could be best friends with Bob Marley. Um, and it's, it's kind of, it's using a bad situation to start creating more powerful images. When you think of, you know, the civil rights movement, there are a lot of really terrible, um, instances and situations um and today they juxtapose those you know they they juxtapose showing an image of um people who might have been trying to do a peaceful protest being hosed um by police with people you know you know rosa parks just sitting on a bus and i think it's when and throughout history as a species we always get very heightened very quickly um, but I think it's when people use those times to really show to, to you know the again not to use the word juxtaposition too many times, but to really show the contrast from you you know one group of citizens who might you know demographically look exactly the same as those that are running around looting are also standing in front of cops. So I think at this point it's kind of which story will win out because with the media and not to, you know, make Baltimore seem lesser, but to go back to, you know, Joey's original point was kind of tying in the idea, sex is good, but have you tried garlic bread? Um, sex is good, have you tried rioting? The, you know, sex also is, is something that the media has taken and has made seem so mainstream and commonplace that people are like, that's got to be the only thing you can do. Right now, it seems like, you know, violence is the only thing that we can do when it's normal. And that's why people think that this is the most violent moment in history, when really, I mean, I think an argument could be made for uh, the Crusades, it could be made for the Roman, you know, con you know Romans conquering everything, the, ho yeah, exactly right, and the Holocaust. Like, there's, and you know, there, throughout history, it's been terrible. It's just people kind of forget the passions that were happening in those moments. And I think with today's media, you see the passion as much as you see and hear the actions. So does anyone, does that make sense? 
Trail of Tears says what? That's a prime example. If the media had been around back then, that would have been an interesting thing to show the Native Americans giving up their guns and forced to walk the Trail of Tears and pretty much just like, hey, you know what? You're going to get this small patch of land and we're going to do our thing and keep spreading our violence because that's what we do. We just keep spreading the violence. Well, it wouldn't matter anyway in the first place because, one, back then all media outlets were owned by white people in the first place. And two, society was a whole lot different back then, too, whereas treating other races in that kind of aspect was pretty condoned, actually, or pretty, I guess, accepted widely. I mean, I wouldn't say now that'd just be wrong, and nobody in today's society would stand for that. Well, Trail of Tears was one of the worst atrocities the United States has ever committed, with the exception of the bombing of Hiroshima, even though that was in wartime. But still, like there are a lot of things that have gone wrong that have gone that way for the good of rich people or even class warfare, as far as that entire guideline goes across history. You can argue class warfare. You can argue race warfare or even re- religious warfare. I mean, they're all applicable. And the fact of the matter is they all involve violence in one way or another instead of actually talking a problem out and actually reaching a compromise where all people can live in a peaceful manner. Mainly because back then, nobody gave a shit about peace, really. It was all about what do you have and what do I want and how bad do I want it to where I kill you just because I can. So what you're saying is that Call of Duty is going to come out with religious warfare? Well, I would probably say it's pretty applicable because they have a smoke grenade that's going to be called Holy Smoke. Call of Duty Religious Warfare could be Call of Duty The Crusades. Hell, I would have to say, safely, religion is probably the basis for most of the world's murders, the wars itself, that have happened throughout the beginning of time, either religion or race. Those two main things throw in money for a third topic, and those three have the entire monopoly on all war and or murder over the past 10,000 years. So right now, is it fair to say that it's Call of Duty Urban Warfare? No, I'm pretty sure it's Call of Duty CVS Warfare. You know, and not once did I see one Walmart ever get looted. Sam Walton's ghost prevents it, forms a barrier around it. I'm just saying, I mean, hey, if you're going to go for full-on looting, why not hit up the biggest place you can find versus a gas station? Do you think that Hands Up Don't Shoot would have helped back then? I don't think Hands Up Don't Shoot works now. Philip, (laughs) as a black man, let me ask you this question quite personally, and so we can get this entire thing just put out there in public. When you see a police officer, what is your immediate reaction? Well, it it all depends on the situation, honestly, and it depends on where I am. Cause like, <clears throat> like I said, like I I'm moving I'm moving back to the south now, but like I I lived in New York for a year, and I know that in New York, out of <clears throat> I think it's I think there's like I think in like in Manhattan there's like 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 two hundred thousand youth between the ages of like like 16 and 20 something and out of those 200,000 I think 180,000 of them got stopped at least twice so like honestly like what do I do like it depends on where I am like if I'm like like I'm a very hello how are you doing type person so like you know I mean like I say hello to everybody no matter what I'm doing but like depending on like depending on where I am like I usually like you know like say hello to them or it depends on what time of the day especially like 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 being like I'm a wa- I'm a wanderer I like walking around everywhere and like when I was when I went to Auburn from undergrad I used to walk like I used to come back from class at like you know like er- like class or the library like really late at night so like whenever like I would see like a cop like you know like I'll make sure that like you know like my hands aren't in my pockets like, like I'll have like take my hood off, like you know, like kind of standing in the light, cause not only am I am I black, I'm very black. Like I'm like I'm like if I'm in the dark, if I close my eyes and close my mouth, you can't see me. Type dark. And I know. So you're this. saying that you're so you're saying that you're midnight. Yes, I am. I'm close to midnight, and it's okay with me. You know, I'm embracing it. But like I've, <laughs> <laughs> like I've. I learned like I've like since going like because like because I'm from the north and going to the south since going to the south like and I like I'm from I'm from the suburbs like I I've been to the like I went to the city but like I never really like had that much experience with like a bunch of cops because like cops really don't come around where I'm from but like I learned that like you know like certain things to do and not to do certain things to say and not to say like I've learned that like it's a very good chance that I'm going to get stopped, which I've gotten stopped multiple times while I was in Auburn. 
Like I, for instance, I was, <clears throat> I was pulling out from going to Cheeburger Cheeburger. I reversed and I went. I drove like a hundred feet, turned the corner. A cop stopped me right there. And instead of asking me for like my driver's license, he looked straight through, straight through, and asked my asked my then then first date girlfriend, "Hey, are you okay?" And then said something to me because she's white and I'm black. So like I'm used to like I'm used to like I would say like undercover racism or whatever or like being stereotyped or like like especially like walking around Auburn like I'm used to like being stereotyped like oh who's this black guy walking around with a hood he he must not go here he must go down the street to Tuskegee or something like that or or oh he's trying to rob somebody or oh he's trying to break something because it seems like every time like I did anything in that they're like oh we heard there was like break-ins and people walking around and like looking in windows like what do I need to look in the window of somebody for this is this is a 2000s if I want to see somebody naked I'll just look on the internet like leave me alone but um I just you know like me I'm kind of just like I know people are gonna do it so I kind of just like turn my turn my eye like not turn my eye to it like just like I you know, just like let it roll off my back but like some people get real angry about it and I don't know why because like you know like if you just like you know give them your license let them do whatever they want they'll let you go on your way you just I don't know people just get angry because like oh like, cause you see in all these videos, like they get like arrested and like, you see them like scrumming around, like screaming at them. Like, yeah, I'm putting my arm around behind my back. Oh, don't touch me. Blah, blah, blah. Like you just sit there and just let them like, you know, like put their, put the handcuffs on you and you tell them like, Hey, those are too tight or something like nine, 98% of cops. If you're cool to them, they'll be cool to you. And like, I mean, like if you don't act stupid, if you don't act like, I don't like using the word ghetto, but like, if you don't act like like a ratchet ghetto person, they won't treat you like one. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I know one place that you'll never get stopped. Where? The SAE fraternity house. <laughs> <laughs> that is very funny. If I get pulled over at night, my window is not going more than a quarter of the way to halfway down because I've had friends who've been pulled over at night and we've been, you know, they recommend as a woman, it, you know, Cops have historically sometimes asked for other things in, you know, exchange for not writing a ticket. And I'm not about to deal with that. And I had a friend in college who she did that. She rolled her window halfway down and the cop was infuriated by it to the point where she called another. She called 911 to say, I do not feel safe with this cop I'm sitting with right here. And another cop had to come out. So he could finish doing, you know, like running her ticket number because he just would not leave it alone that she did not feel comfortable halfway rolling down her window because you can easily hand a license through that. And, you know, I've been when you're in high school, they they teach you those kinds of things like how to protect yourself as a woman. And, you know, I'm kind of in, you know, I agreement with Philip that I just, you know, I do what they say, but I don't necessarily automatically trust anyone with authority because I think just as many people who respect it and will use it for good will also there's also going to be people who use it for bad every single group no matter race color creed gender there's a bell curve there's people who are you know run of the mill regular great there's people who are spectacular and awesome and then there's scum and you just you don't know who you're dealing with but it's better to be on the safe side just do what they say while, you know, protecting yourself a little bit, but not to egg anything on, because you just, you never know who you're dealing with. I have to ask this question as a group-wide question for everybody to answer. I'm not sure if if many of you saw the interview that took place today or not, but they recently questioned our president about the entire Baltimore issue. And granted, I give them credit for saying that they were thugs and criminals and that it needs to stop. But do you think, to a certain context that eventually talking will only go so far until you actually have to make an actual effort getting them to actually stop whatever they're doing. Right now, the mayor of Baltimore, this is actually a current news line, they made more room for the cops to back further away so that people could could destroy to their heart's content. She allowed people to destroy more public and private property just because the cops – she actually told, told the cops to move further back and, and to let them destroy to their heart's contents. And to me, I, I'm trying to think of how, one, she can do this 
as a public official and allow that to actually happen under her jurisdiction or her authority as a mayor of that city. And even then to give it a thumbs up saying, go ahead, go for it. I'm just trying to think how responsible that is as a public official, especially sending the right message to the current generation or the even younger generation that's currently watching this right now, wondering what the hell's going on within our own country. But like in all honesty, like I'm not quite sure like if the like if the rioting's still going like full force. I really kind of tuned it out. But like in all honesty, to stop all those like because I'm pretty sure that most of the people that are rioting are just rioting because they're just like angry and they have nothing else to do and they just want to break, give themselves a reason to break cop cars and stuff. But like the only like all the rioters are doing is they're just making it so that like like once like they push that hand like they're going to have to take like you know like lethal action and start doing like crazy things like you know big violent things and just being like oh the police are angry and they're killing people and stuff like that and it's just like you know like like a double-edged sword in my my opinion like they're just they're just creating bad stuff for themselves because like you know i mean like don't you have a job like why are you why are you on the street riding all day long like don't aren't you like go to your job like like do something like then people will start wondering like oh why do why do people in the city get a bad rap or like oh why this and that like you start acting right then like people will treat you right I don't know it's just weird and then people want wonder why we don't want to pay them fifteen dollars to work at McDonald's. I was gonna respond to the comments about the mayor uh, telling the police force to back up and let them continue rioting. Please go ahead. So one it, it's not like she just said hey go to town. It was like that's a decision that you have to make between balancing the safety of your of all the humans involved, both the rioters and the the police force, versus property damage. You know, would you rather have some more broken windows and some stolen condoms, or you know several dead people? You I mean, the the way a mob works, it's more like a fire than it is actually people making decisions. It's largely instinctual once it gets started, and violence really doesn't end it. Um, it just it just really doesn't do very much at all. So are you saying that it's better to destroy piece by piece the city that you live in and the community, which is going to have to be repaired and replaced? And I don't know if any of the businesses, I don't know, property insurance, whatever the correct term is, is going to cover all of that damage. So what's going to end up happening? Are they going to end up having to raise taxes to make up for the the money that it's going to take to rebuild the city? And then let's say that they can't salvage the building, then they're going to have to demolish it. So now, you know, you have all that stuff that's going to take place. So like, where do you draw the line on how much they're permitted to destroy versus how much that the city is going to have to pay in order to repair all the damages? I'm you not sure how much it's going to be. I'm not sure how much it's going to be, but they can steal all the condoms they want to, probably do this generation and the next one a damn favor in the process. You ask the CDC, they actually have a calculation for the value of a human life. So if you're balancing the the, uh, the value of a human life with some property damage, you can actually do it um, in terms of dollars and mathematics if you really wanted to. But they're not generally doing too much of that behind the scenes. They're really just going, you know, what would I rather have press of that I'm uh, telling my police officers to start firing at uh, a handful of rioters or that I let them back off a little bit and do a couple, you know, $100,000 worth of property damage. Where's Batman when we need him? Beating up thugs and alleys and not dealing with riots. Yeah, he's wasting billions of dollars fighting individual people, so he's not exactly a good crime fighter. And uh, there is a 10 p.m. curfew, and we all know that he only comes out at night. I agree with you, Jason. You know, there's a certain point where if they're just, if, if people aren't going to stop rioting, if they just want to smash and grab stuff. It's kind of like when you let a kid, they're really angry, just beat your pillow. Just have it out. Tire yourself out. Because at the end of the day, the more, at this point, I think that the police try to solely stop individuals, it's going to cause more stories. It's going to cause more racial incidents. I don't think people are particularly only seeing cop uniform civilian. I think it, it's there's many facets to this problem. So if they want to beat up a building, that's much better than them beating up someone who's, you know, might have joined the force just to try to do their job. And that's another human life that could be in danger just because someone's uncontrollably angry. So what you're saying is we need to bring Mari Povich down and have some paternity tests done. 
if they're stealing condoms and all, I mean, I don't know what else they're stealing, but uh, hopefully, you know, nine months from now, we can say, you are not the father. You are not the father. <laughs> or or what we got to do is we got to use the fire and we got to get the local Italian people together and we just got to make shit tons of garlic bread. Right. That's what really going to have to come down to it. Yeah, I just had a thought. What if Jesus was Italian and at the Last Supper he had garlic bread? Oh, God, that'd be good communion every Sunday, garlic bread. So you're saying that Jesus is the original Godfather? Absolutely. Don Cristo. Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I think a lot of people have refused his offer. I would agree with that. So that's our show. Hopefully you found us entertaining. If not, send us an email and let us know. Go to www.roundtablephilosophy.com forward slash contact. Fill out the form and give us your feedback. If you'd like, you can follow us on our Facebook page. You can go to facebook.com forward slash roundtable philosophy. You can follow us on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash RT philosophy. Other than that, just check out our site on a weekly basis for new and entertaining podcasts. Thanks so much.